You're listening to The Nature of Story. I'm Michael Nielsen. This is a series of conversations about storytelling in society. Thanks so much for joining me again for another episode. Uh, today we have uh, someone I'm really excited to share with you, uh, Jim Signorelli. He's a, a writer uh, and business person that I've been following for quite a long time. Um, we actually met uh, casually a number of years ago in Chicago uh, when I went to um, a storytelling event uh, being put on by Michael Margolis. Um, and I believe Jim was hosting the event at his office at the time. Um, uh, so we had very brief interaction, but uh, uh, while we were there, he gave me um, uh, an early copy of his uh, uh, yet-to-be-published book, Story Branding, at the time. And since then, he's had a couple other editions of it, um, but it's, it's quickly become one of the most accessible books on storytelling, in my view, from the perspective of people with marketing backgrounds. Um, it uses, you know, the marketing jargon, marketing terminology, and marketing, you know, knowledge that folks would have uh, as the bedrock for which to jump off and talk about storytelling, as opposed to the kind of stuff that really speaks easily to me because of the fact that I have a film background, and I'll I'll gravitate more towards like Robert McKee, who's a story uh, a screenwriting uh, guy. So, um, but this book has just become one of my absolute go-tos in terms of finding ways to frame the importance of storytelling and the mechanics of it to marketers. So I can't recommend it enough. Um, and uh, Jim himself, he's a marketing thought leader and speaker who has been acclaimed as one of the world's foremost experts on the subject of story branding. Signorelli's articles and interviews have been featured in magazines, newspapers, and on radio talk shows throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe. His career has been spent working at major advertising agencies throughout the U.S. on accounts like Citibank, General Electric, Toshiba, Kraft Foods, Burger King, KFC, Taco Bell, McDonald's, the American Marketing Association, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and many others. Jim is the founder and CEO of, uh, well, here it says ESW Story Lab. I believe it's just called Story Lab Chicago now, um, which has been cited as one of the top 25 agencies in Chicago by Crane's Chicago Business and has been named on the Inc., to the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing independent companies in the U.S. for three straight years. His first edition of Story Branding was awarded a gold medal in marketing advertising from the Axiom Business Book Awards. Additionally, Jim is the recipient of U.S. Bank's Smart Leaders Award. So he does a lot of public speaking, um, a lot of doing shows like this. Um, so uh, he was gracious enough to give me an hour of his time to talk over some of this stuff, and I really think you're going to find it incredibly valuable. So without further ado... I give you Jim Signorelli. So, so in, in big picture, I actually just kind of wanted to start with something you try and establish early on in your book, which is the difference in your mind between storytelling proper and story branding, that you were kind of trying to make a distinction between those two practices. And I wanted right. to let you kind of lay the groundwork on that for our discussion here. Well, yeah, it, and I'm glad you asked because it's a source of a lot of confusion. <laughs> Branding and storytelling are, you can find them in the same toolbox, but they're as similar as a, a flat edge and a Phillips uh, screwdriver. You know, they, they, they have very different purposes. Um, storytelling is really about, as you might imagine, telling, <laughs> uh, communicating, uh, and it's a form of communication. Uh, story branding is what you do before you tell the story. You figure out what the story should be. Uh, and it's a process uh, that that uh, was developed for that purpose. Um, it, storytelling is like any other communication technique, a very powerful one, uh, albeit uh, it is a technique uh, for communicating and persuading. Um, story branding is, uh, uses story structure, um, and I can tell you a little more about that later, I guess, uh, but uses story structure to help people to better relate to what a brand is all about. Yeah. And so, and so how did you stumble upon this? Because your, your background is in branding and marketing. Uh, and, and how did you come upon the story angle? Well, well as you know, uh, brands have tangible characteristics, logos, uh, color palettes, the product design, things you can you know, just reach out and touch. Um, but they also have intangibles, the way people feel or thoughts associated with a given brand. And that's, that part's a little harder to get your head around. And, uh, you know, trying to explain to somebody what the intangibles are and how to make the most out of them is a little like trying to explain fan, uh, uh, quantum physics to me. And good luck, <laughs> that'll never happen. But um, 
it, it's, it, it gets very complex. So uh, in an effort to really help people to understand that part of branding, I, uh, I zeroed in on something that everybody can relate to, and that is stories. You know, we, there was a study that was conducted by a guy by the name of Robin Dunbar. He's an evolutionary biologist in, at, at Oxford. And he, over the course of many years, he's conducted studies and has determined that close to two-thirds of our conversations are in the form of somebody doing something to accomplish some goal whether it's gossip or uh, a recount of an experience, what have you, but we're always telling stories. So, you know, I, I, I thought, hey, there's, there's the ticket. If I could relate brands to stories somehow or the, the concept of branding and especially the intangible part to what a story is all about and how it's structured, it might, uh, might be something that people can better relate to. Right. And so, so you found it as a, as a clarification tool in trying to get at that more, the, the intangible aspects of a brand. Um, I, as I recall from reading your book, it used uh, more often than not actually as a tool of articulating those intangibles to the creatives ba ba through the creative brief or what you would have thought the creative brief would be, you now use as a story brief. Um, uh, some way of, of better setting that creative act in motion that, 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 that's less literal minded, less analytical. I don't know how else you would say this. Yeah. It, well, a couple of things. One is that it, it started out as a, uh, a way to communicate how to think of a brand, right. um, but it evolved into something much bigger than that. Um, because in the process of working through this structure, uh, a number of observations were made relative to the way a lot of traditional brands go about the process. And uh, so through uh, outlining and evolving this process, we were able to uncover some of the faults and the foibles of current practice. Um, so that's one part of what we do. But another thing is that um, the uh, the purpose is, yes, ultimately the deliverable is a creative brief, but it goes well beyond that. Uh, it's not just for creatives. In fact, it's something I tell people that isn't really a, a function of marketing you know, or, or advertising. That's just a very small part of story branding. It's all about turning your brand into a story, living your your story, if you will. And that has to start at the top and it's got to go all the way through the organization, right up to the, you know, the person who answers the phone, uh, uh, or anybody who is in, in, in uh, you know, contact with customers. Uh, it has to do with the way employees relate to each other. Um, it, it, it has to do with the culture of the company. Um, and you know, a lot of companies, in fact, I read a study not too long ago where something like 55% of employees don't know what the purpose of their company is, yeah. and they want to know. Um, you know, so it, it's it's a it's a tool that can help any company uh, to really define what their culture is, uh, not only for the purpose of moving the company together, but for bringing employees uh, that purpose that, in fact, they're hungry to get. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, I tell, I tell people, I probably shouldn't say this, but you know, it, it I think this is a process that better for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and for people who are in business for themselves, obviously entrepreneurs, um, simply because they're always there. You know, they're not like the CEO who's there for 18 months and has a bad, you know, a, a, a bad, uh, quarterly report and, is gone the next day and a new guy comes in and he's got a whole new vision and it all changes. Um, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it, it really works well for companies that are run by somebody who, who has a vision and who's going to be there permanently or semi permanently until somebody else takes over who carries that vision forward. Um, and like I say, this is much more than a marketing function. It really involves everyone at the top of the organization. Yeah, no, I I buy that completely, and that jives with my experience as well. Do you that that stat about fifty five percent of employees, uh, or roughly that, not feeling they, like they understand the purpose of the business they're working with? What do you think that is a symptom of? Nobody's telling them, or if they're telling them, they don't they they aren't telling them that in a way that really engages them. You know, they'll get up and read a mission statement. 
Okay. Well, you read a, one mission statement, you read them all. And then you move around the words and you have another, you have a different mission statement, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. Um, But they're not really communicating. That's another thing that uh, I've gotten into since story branding and I've evolved into, uh, uh, I, I started a company called Story Lab and we conduct workshops to help leaders and salespeople, but leaders primarily uh, do a better job of communicating their purpose in the form of a story uh, and helping people to, to really, to, to relate and connect to that story uh, as opposed to, you know, sending around a memo or, um, you know, putting the mission statement on the uh, front wall for everybody to read as they walk in, you know, it's, it's a way to make that, it, to embed that uh, purpose within the organization. And storytelling is a great, great way to do that. You know, storytelling different from the once upon a time type storytelling. Storytelling that's specifically um, designed to help leaders better communicate, clarify, persuade, influence, motivate, etc. Yeah, so. and and that that difference um, is something I'd, I'd zero in on as well um, uh, between the, what you say, like the once upon a time type story mm-hmm. and the more purposeful story. Um, that's also uh, similar to storytelling versus story branding. That's a, dif- a difficult thing to articulate occasionally. How do you, I, yeah. I wish there was another name for storytelling. I know. Because, you know, you mentioned storytelling and somebody's thinking about, you know, the three bears and Goldilocks, you yep. know what I mean? And it's it's uh, it's got this ice cream and cake connotation, yep. <laughs> um, and it's it's a challenge to help people to see. Although it's becoming less a challenge, I think storytelling, especially, has become you know the new hammer in marketing. I mean, it's you know everything's a nail. Let's use storytelling. Yeah. Um, and people are becoming more familiar, and it's losing some of that cachet, but it's still there. You know. We're going to go to a storytelling workshop. Well, that'll be fun. Should I bring my blanket? You know, what I mean. <laughs> It, it gets, yeah, it's it's difficult, but um, but there are a lot of things that come out of the science, not just the art, but the science of storytelling, um, uh, which is evolving as we speak. Uh, you know that leaders and salespeople can use to to effectively uh, communicate uh, and to really uh, translate hard cold facts into something that's meaningful that's something that people can relate to and identify with yeah well it's, it's interesting because I, I we had kendall haven on on the show at one point oh, um, yeah and, and he was great and i actually heard of him from your book so that so thank you, you for that <laughs> um but 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 you know it's fascinating to think that kind of anyone who starts to get interested in this storytelling thing at a certain point realizes in order to have any meaningful progress whatsoever, you have to define it for yourself in some way. Like, what right. do we mean when we say storytelling? As you say, we, we almost wish there were five different words for it that meant all the different shades we're talking about. Um, can, can you can you take me through your experience of asking that of yourself and, and what, what you oh. came to? <laughs> well, it's interesting you should bring up Kendall Haven because he's the hero of this story. <laughs> um, you know, I started, when I started writing the book, you know, I needed a definition. I mean, if I'm going to talk about story structure, I really ought to know what a story is and uh, you know, I'd go to page 93 in Google and I, before I'd find two definitions that were the same, you know, a story is a, uh, has a beginning, middle and an end, you know, so there's a bologna sandwich and, uh, uh, you know, stories, uh, are a recount of events. Well, I got up this morning, I read the newspaper, I had coffee and I went to work. Well, there's events, but don't wait for the movie. So, yeah. you know, it's a matter of, uh, coming up with an operational definition and it was, and I almost gave up until I got Kendall's book. Yeah. This book is called story proof, as you know, and he spent years uh, studying uh, the science of story. And he's a scientist, a NASA scientist, as you know, and the, the, the story goes, I guess that he was teaching other scientists using storytelling as a form of communication until his boss said, Hey, uh, these are scientists. They want facts. They don't want stories. And he's like, Oh no, no, that's not true. And that started him on this journey to really define, you know, what is the purpose of stories and why do they work better than hard cold facts? And um, but the first half of his book is all about, you know, what is a story? I looked here, I looked there, I couldn't find it. But then on chapter, I don't know, seven or something, he gets to, uh, you know, the the uh, 
the end of the rainbow for me, which was the definition of story that really coincides with what a brand is all about. And that is a narrative about a character setting out to accomplish some goal and who meets with obstacles along the way. Right. I mean, tell me a brand that that doesn't fit. Right. The thing about it, though, is that the uh, unlike um, we are taught in B-School that, you know, the customer is the hero. Um, in this case, the brand is the hero. It's the thing that people uh, aspire to emulate, look up to, uh, for, you know, uh, it's, it's the thing that provides people with meaning. Um, and the whole story branding process is about, uh, figuring out ways to give that character meaning, you know, it, you, certainly characters have two layers as we talk about in the book, the outer layer, which is all about what they do, yeah. but the inner layer is their motivation. And that's really at the core of a brand story is why it exists, yeah. what's its purpose beyond profit, um, what is it trying to, what's its mission, what's, what, what is it, and I, I use the mission in a different sense than I used it earlier, right. uh, but uh, maybe a better word for it is a, a movement, mm -hmm. what is it trying to get people to follow, um, and that's basically the structure that really helped me to start up and write, finish writing the book yeah. that I stopped writing as a result. So, yeah. Well, and, 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 uh, you know, I personally care a lot about storytelling and the reason why I, why I do this show is because I'm, I'm fascinated with figuring out how to more effectively communicate anything. Um, mm -hmm. and storytelling feels like one major component of, of, of thinking about that. Um, and I find it really ironic and I don't, I haven't found a way to make this jive in my brain yet, but I'm curious just what your thoughts would be. I find it really ironic that a guy who was trying to advocate to NASA the persuasive power of story ended up having to go super data heavy to convince them. I, and it's just it's just interesting. It's just ironic, and I, and it's not a criticism of Kendall, but I just I'm just curious how you if you see the irony in that as well. I don't know. However, if you look at the way he presents the data, yeah. it's in the, the story. I suppose. Yeah, and it's not like uh, you know, it's not just a. A tick off of bullet points about statistical inferences that can be made from various studies is, right. you know, uh, this professor had this idea that perhaps, you know, storytelling uh, is something that we all do. And what he did, much to uh, everybody's surprise, is he went out and he uh, had his students eavesdrop in coffee shops and places where people congregate just to, to listen to what they were talking about. And lo and behold, what he found out is that 66% of what they were talking about was in the form of a story. Right, I mean, it's right. that kind of an explanation, which is very different than, you know, we found out that 66% uh, of our conversation is in the form of stories, and uh, that's statistically significant within the confidence level of blah, 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 and, you know, that kind of a reason. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, or, or read an abstract, read a, an academic abstract, right. okay, right. a research uh, article. Um, that will give you the opposite <laughs> of what Kendall Haven does in this book. Right. Abstract background. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the, the, it's, it's interesting because the you, you sort of did it even there where you where you talk about yeah, the story from the point of view of the scientists, you know, in theory, find, researching this, wondering this big question. And then lo and behold, they find this solution. Um, it, it, it feels like in most, pr most things that are primary story like that, where you're embedding information or data or facts into it, like for example, that, that idea, lo and behold, 66% of people, you know, uh, 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 you know, are talking in forms of story. It seems to be that the data gets buried in that kind of turning point, gets buried in that, that moment of revelation more often than not. So like you're like, you even just did there, like, you know, there, there's, he has this question, he's seeking it. He's looking for things. He's it's, it's hard to do. And then one day, finally, Eureka 66%. And, and, and I've, I've found that to be a recurring thing as well, but I don't know if that is something that you found in your experience also that, that if you're trying to bury specific data points, there seems to be specific places in the story that store in the story structure that you would want to bury these things in order to be most effective. Right, right. And remember, a story, uh, every story has to have a conflict. Every story has to have a problem that needs to be solved. And the best stories are those that really engage us not in the result, but in the conflict. Yeah. I tell this to, to be, you know, one of the things we teach in our workshops is how to conduct or how to uh, uh, transform a, uh, 
uh, a case history or success story into a, a, a real story. Most yeah. case histories are, you know, well, we worked for X, Y, Z, and they had this problem, and we came in and we solved it, and the results are fifty percent increase in sales in the last three months or something. You know? As opposed to, you know, I was work. I got a call one day from Joe Schmo, who was the uh, the HR person from X, Y, Z company. And this guy was pulling out his hair because, you know, he could not make the changes within this organization. He went, we went through all of what he talked about, you know, and he tried this and he tried that and he tried all these other sources and, you know, nothing was working. I walked away thinking, I, you know, frankly, I don't know what the solution is, but then it hit me. And then yeah. you go yeah. into the solution and you explain kind of what happened. And, you know, as I'm telling you this, you know, you can see Joe Schmo, you can see, you know, us dealing with the conflict. Uh, when I just recite facts about what we did and the results we achieved, there's no emotional connection there. There's nothing that, you know, involves you as the listener. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it's a matter of, you know, you want to get to the data point. To your point, you want to get to the data point, but we want to make sure that you have enough conflict there to make it interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, and as and, at, you you made the point perfectly about the, the idea of you know the the level of engagement seems directly proportional to how hard it is, and that that you know like you know how how high are those stakes because you're going to be your audience will be more invested depending on what those things are. We we did a series of videos for a building contractor here in Madison, J.P. Cullen, where they we were, we were turning case stories or uh, case studies into video stories, like little documentaries about them. And they were confused at first because we were trying to say, okay, of these case studies, what was the hardest thing you had to go through in order to complete this job? What was the, the toughest part? You know, Excellent. yeah, that's, 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 you They're know, really excavating the conflict. Right. And, and, it, and it's, it's counter. 99% of case histories go rise. Exactly. They, don't really, they don't dramatize the problem. Yeah. They don't something you know the best stories uh, the best case histories are when the audience can think yeah i have that problem yeah. you know i'm not the only one wow this is great you know i don't feel lonely anymore you right. know and it, it, you know all of a sudden you see people kind of moving forward in, yep. in their seats unlike they normally do when you're giving that uh, <laughs> dissertation of a case dis history that, um, you know so there's a big difference yeah a big well, and if, and if you can make if you can make them somehow just question how how do they get out of this like you know like like if, if you can make the problem hard enough where it's like you know i i don't see the solution and how are they going to actually do this it's like yeah then you're very good you've really That's got exactly. it um I, 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 I conduct some of my workshops <laughs> <laughs> i want to attend one first um uh the uh, uh but but i also want to touch on this this outer layer inner layer thing so so okay. when i first read this this book um uh, uh I read that in the context as a filmmaker, um, where I've always thought of characterization, doing you know how someone looks and you know what their accent is and all this stuff, as uh, and then true character, which is you know kind of what's inside and how they act. And in drama, the most dramatic characters in many cases have a conflict between those two. Whereas in branding, I think you're right that you're you're wanting more congress between the two. You're wanting them absolutely. You know, they have to, to justify. They have to link. Yeah. You know, and, and it, you know, the, the outer layers is the telling part. You know, that's the storytelling part, you know, where you tell people um, who you are and what you do. But the motivation, you can't tell people, you know, what you believe in. Or, you know, I mean, you can, but it's better to have them, you know, have it seen or manifested in the outer layer. Yeah. You know, the inner layer is what drives everything. But it's not something, you know, you talk or brag about. Right. Know, we believe in independence. We, can you imagine if Harley Davidson said, "We believe in freedom and independence," right. as opposed to showing freedom and independence in the in the characterization of their brand? I mean, um, you know, it's it 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 has to manifest itself out here, um, and it has to connect to the inner layer, the inner motivation of any brand, in order for there to be congruency. Otherwise, the consumers don't, huh? Right. Don't get you know they. They're, they're motivated this way, but they do that. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, and, and it, it for for branding, I take it in your experience, it's more the 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 outer layer is is the evidence that the customer or the prospect is exactly. going to see that suggests the inner layer. Right. Yeah. Exactly right. 
Exactly. Because yeah. most brands, I, I, like, like you said, I think they want to state out loud what the inner layer is. They want to just say it. Like, you know, right. you know, we are, yeah, we are independents or we value, you know, our employees or we do whatever. And, and yeah, that, that way of thinking of those two layers is really helpful, I think. Right. Um, you know, you take a brand like, uh, like Apple, you know, their real, their motivation is really to had been, I don't know quite, I think things have changed a little bit since Steve Jobs passed away, unfortunately, but, um, their inner layer was all about, um, going against the status quo, going against the grain, being different. Uh, in fact, that was their theme line, uh, be different. But um, is that it? be different or? Think, think different, different, I think, yeah. Right, right, okay. So, um, but they never said, you know, well, we're all about being different. Yeah. Uh, you know, they said think different as a call to action or as a belief statement or as a rallying cry for the people and for their employees. But the demonstration was in, being different. I mean, it was all about everything they do is different, has to be different in order for it to be part of Apple. Uh, and it became an expectation for consumers to see Apple as always having something that's, you know, out of the box, uh, that is very unusual and unexpected. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it's it's found in that evidence, not in what you tell everybody it is. You know, it's like the it's like the girl in high school says, you know, who tells you that she's cool. Yeah, she's not. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just because she told you that. I mean, it, it, it works against you to tell people what you value and what you believe. You got to, you know, words speak. I mean, actions speak louder than words. Basically. Yeah. 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 It all comes back to just that simple axiom. Right. <laughs> So you mentioned that you think people are getting more or brands are getting more receptive to this idea of incorporating storytelling because it's become a buzzword and because a lot of people are saying it and become a hammer. Do these, um, what was it like when you first started trying to push this? Were people really receptive or were, did you need to coerce and convince people to like give it a shot? And No, you know, actually, um, it's intuitive. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even with, you know, the more linear minded, uh, 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 people, you know, engineers and accountants, uh, you know, they get it because they relate to what stories are. You know, everybody does. They tell stories too. And if you kind of, you know, the whole story branding approach puts it into their realm, helps them to relate to branding in a way that's very different. Now, you know, where I ran into difficulties wasn't with, uh, uh, you know, people who are new to branding or, like I say, those engineers and accountants uh, who are more linear thinking. We ran into problems with, with people who have done, have approached branding the, the same way for 25, 30 years. I mean, this is the way we've done it and it's the way we'll always, you know, do it. In fact, we got hired by a client. I'll leave the name out. But, um, and, and they hired us because of. When I was when I owned the agency, they hired us because of story branding. We love this process, and when we got to the first meeting, uh, you know, the 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 uh, CEO of the company looked at us and he said, "Well, you know, where's the creative brief? Mm -hmm. well, well, we don't do those. Remember, <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to have that. You know, I mean, we got to have that, and we got to have a definition of the prospect. We got to have." You know how they think and how they feel and all the stuff that's typical of a uh, typically found in a creative brief and it was it was very strange you know but we that was not just an exception uh, it, it happened a lot you know where they could really relate to it but because the organization was so embedded around doing it the same way it's always been done uh, it was very difficult to to change that uh, that thinking and. and what what in your uh, your mind at that time was wrong with the status quo? What what why why oh. wouldn't you want to do it the same way? Well, this may sound sacrilege, and this is <laughs> what always you know gets people their puts their hair on fire. When I, <laughs> you know, what I learned in school when I studied marketing, uh, and uh, it was drilled into my head that the customer is always right, the customer is king, the customer is hero. You know, you've got to listen to the consumer and do what the consumer wants or else you're going to fail. Well, I, I guess over the years, I just saw so many brands fail because they follow the consumer over the cliff. 
Um, you know, an example, I worked on KFC, and I don't know if you recall the Unthink campaign. I mean, where they're telling, oh, now we're, we've got grilled chicken because they had done all this research and their customers, their lapsed users are saying, we don't come to KFC anymore because it's fried and we'll we become more health conscious. Well, we've got the solution. Unthink KFC. We're no longer that person that we used to think we are. Now we're, we're healthy. In answer and response to that customer, well, sales just plummeted because they forgot their base business. They forgot their base, you know, those that brought them to the dance. And and uh, it, it took a long time to reverse that negative trend. But they followed the consumer's wish. And there are tons of stories like that where, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's one thing to listen to the consumer, and I advocate, I strongly advocate that brands do that, but it's another thing to, to take them for their word and to follow exactly the direction that they provide you. You know, Apple, Harley Davidson, North Face, uh, Ritz Hotels, I mean, you name a, what I call a story brand. They don't go to focus groups and say, hey, what should we be when we grow up? Right. You know, rather, if they use focus groups, which I'm not a big fan of, but if they use focus groups, they use it to find out how best to express what they are, what they believe themselves to be, as opposed to trying to find out if that's who they should be or who they shouldn't be. Yeah. So to answer your question, um, it, I think that's where traditional marketing goes astray, is that the consumer is all-knowing, is all uh, important uh, in terms of helping brands decide who they are. And... Um, it's just taken it way too far. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it sounds like the, the, you know, when, when you describe this, I can't help but think of the, the parallel in, in the film world where you're, you're showing test audiences. And if you give too much credence to specifically what audiences complain about in a film or what they specifically say they like and don't like, you end up making exactly the wrong inferences about yeah. you know like like oh they didn't they said they didn't like this scene well actually what they didn't like is the way you set up the scene and you know the they didn't realize how to articulate that or how to whatever and so it's, and then it's, there's yeah. the guy on the, you know you got 12 people sitting around a table and then there's a guy who's you know got all the answers and right I disagree with that guy you know so yeah, everybody walks out with the, the wrong impression i mean it's yeah. a very thing to do to find out well focus groups i think they started off as a as a tool to explore different ideas you know what do you think of that what do you think of this what do you think of that just to kind of get people to express their opinions and beliefs about various ideas but not to walk away with um, confidence that this is the idea this is the right idea yeah it's use use that audience to help evolve an idea but consequently i've worked with some very sophisticated clients who use them to test advertising to use them to you know, help them define their mission. Um, you know, it's it's crazy, and uh, yeah, and and I think, like I say, I think that's the biggest mistake that traditional marketers make is just putting too much faith in following the consumer. Do you, you know, do you, I was just gonna, yeah. sorry, I was just going to say, who is it? Henry Ford said uh, something about uh, you know, I can make any car. That the consumer wants, as long as it's black, right? And then he pull all these cars, you know. And 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 Steve Jobs had the same approach. He's like, you know, he didn't ask consumers if they wanted a bigger window or, you know, um, uh, if they wanted to go to different, you know, different types of icons that were available through uh, Microsoft when Windows was introduced. He, you know, he came up with what he thought was the best idea, and he evolved it with, you know consumer interaction but he started out with his own idea and built upon it um as opposed to starting with a blank piece of paper and saying hey what do you think yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah you're right it's it i can see how you would how you'd come to the conclusion then that like the the that storytelling is is far easier perhaps for entrepreneurs people who've been around with the company are, are synonymous with the business that they it's easier for them perhaps to trust those internal instincts of who they are and what they have to give I, I find it interesting, and, and, and in, in, in some of my experience where uh, when I'm thinking about what businesses struggle with, I find that there's, a, there's sometimes a clash or a conflict between st what story needs and what business needs in terms of predictability sometimes and, and openness. So like the early on when, when, you're, when you're telling a brand story, do you find 
when when you're asking clients to be very very honest and open to what the brand is and not not trying to second guess the audience out there do you find there there's a, a conflict there in in them almost having a hard time getting to that place where they're like they're they're wanting so badly to hold on to second guessing the audience that they're not even they're not even able to start talking about what we honestly are what we you know what it is or or is that not as big a struggle for you I haven't really run into that all okay. too often. Yeah. Uh, and maybe I run into it more because a lot of the video we do is documentary based. So it's like truly yeah. like, you know, hey, there's some unpredictability here, but you want that because you're actually going to get real honest stuff and good, you know, good stuff out of it. But it's, but I, but I think about that sometimes. Actually, you know, I, I find that uh, at the middle level of management, I'm mm-hmm. down, that people are even more critical of a company oh, than they sure. are. You know, at the top, hey, we're doing everything right. And the model, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, in the middle, it's, it, it's a different story. And so it kind of balances. It, there's a balancing act that goes on, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that as a consultant, that's what I do. I say, well, you know, you feel this way, but your employees feel this way. We yes. got to figure out how we're going to bridge this gap yeah. before we even think about talking to the consumer. Yeah. Okay. Who are we guys? Yeah. And, and, and then once we can get a consensus of them, then we go to the consumer. And then we find that there's a gap between them and management. You know, when the consumer says, this is what we stand for. Consumer saying, I, they don't stand for that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We've got another problem. So, right. And that's how it, how it all you know, comes about. We'll be right back. This podcast is produced by Story First Media, a video content production company focused on storytelling. Cultivate your audience with story, then convert them to customers. Let us know about your upcoming video project at www.storyfirstmedia.com. If you're consuming this content, you're either listening to it as a podcast or you're viewing it as a video because it exists in both forms. If you'd rather watch my guests and I talk over Skype video, You can find this and all subsequent episodes by subscribing to my YouTube channel. Or, if you'd rather listen to the conversation, it's available for download wherever you get your podcasts. I really think these conversations are valuable and will only get better as we go on. And having earned your attention means the world to me. These aren't short conversations. Uh, So if you have any comments, questions, suggestions for guests or topics, books I should read, etc., please, please email me at thenatureofstory at gmail.com. Or get me on Twitter or Facebook at Michael Nielsen. That's N E E L S E N. All right, back to the interview. You, you you said it better than I did, yeah. Because because the the what I'm really thinking about is is that that gap in understanding between like an employee and the people at top, where a lot of times you know uh, it, this we obviously do it through video, you do it more through large larger branding efforts. But that but that idea of management wants uh, they believe a certain message is the message that people would want to most talk about at an employee level, like you know they, that 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 they care most about this thing, they care most about the benefits packages we give them, they care most about whatever else, but if we actually remain open to what the employees genuinely want to talk about, genuinely talk about their passion for the brand and for the business, they surprise them more often than not with what they actually care about. And that disconnect is, I guess, kind of the openness thing that I find interesting. Uh, uh, no, as a matter of fact, one of the things I'm, I'm working on right now, I'm working with some consultants out of Boston who have put together a method for interviewing uh, employees and management uh, using storytelling techniques. Oh, wonderful. It's, it's uh, basically extracting stories that evidence, you know, how people really feel. Yeah. And it's interesting. That's one of the beauties of stories. It always provides more information that's really said. Yes. And it's always something underneath the, that you can pull out. Um, and what they do, they figured out a way to, uh, to measure uh, and put some numbers to, and oh, the, the number crunchers love this, but put some numbers to, you know, what actually is being uh, extracted from these stories and the extent to which they really form the impression of the company by, you know, the, uh, the aggregate. 
Um, and it's a really interesting process. I, have, I just started working with them on this. Um, and hopefully by the end of the year, we're going to have an actual methodology that we can deploy. Uh, but um, it's, you know, at the base of it is storytelling. Yeah. It's you know, getting people to tell stories because that's where the truth is. Yeah. That's where the, you know, when you ask somebody for their opinion, you know, they're going to say, well, I like it or I don't like it or whatever. But you're, number one, you're not getting very much depth. Okay. Number two, you may be getting an answer to a question that, uh, uh, is is being given to you for convenience sake or because something doesn't want to be said. But when you're asking for a story, you know, you start a question with not with why, but with when did this hap less happen? Or where did this, where did you first experience this? That's where you get the truth. Yeah. In fact, we use that when we are interviewing people. We always ask when and where questions as opposed to why or how. You know, we got to what, why and how, but you know, we were always digging for stories because inevitably, without knowing it, uh, candidates would tell us things that uh, they wouldn't tell us otherwise. You know, um, they, they, you know, in the, in the conversation, they'd bring up, um, you know, the fact that they're, they're um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example of their, their mother was a, a college professor. Yeah. That wouldn't come up in any question that would be asked, but yet there's some there's something to be said about somebody being raised by a college professor. Not that it's necessarily good or bad, but that's a piece of information that you add to other pieces of information that come to you through a story that gives you a more complete perspective of that person that you're talking to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it takes a certain amount of courage on the part of the, the brand and the management to, to, to explore some of that sometimes. It's cool, <laughs> but it's really rewarding as, as, as we know. Um, yeah. you're, you're, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, facts and data, because 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 you you met you actually put really good articulation to when facts are needed um, uh, 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 in a story and when to employ them. The, uh, uh, like in what scenarios are they most needed? Um, I, I I have the the page open actually right now because I never actually had it put this succinctly before. So I have you to thank for this. Um, oh. uh, uh, but the idea of uh, it's it three three reasons to use facts is when it's new news. When the oh. price is important and when risks are high, and I've 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 struggled for a long time to think of to to try to articulate both to myself and to other people when I'm working with them about when when it's okay to go a little more fact heavier when it's okay oh. yeah to put a little more validation yeah um, in a couple chapters before that I, I in a in a very story esque sort of way I talk about this thing called the product life cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, every product is like a person that lives and dies and grows in between, right? Um, and it depends on where you are relative to that growth cycle as to whether facts are more important than not. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm working with a, with a startup company, and they have a, a process that's proprietary, and I can't really talk about it, but it's really out of the realm of anything that's been, uh, been done in this particular space. Um, well, uh, think different or <laughs> be all you can be or whatever you want. You know, that's not going to work. Right. Um, right. The, the, the facts need to be told. However, they, they can be told in a story and that's where storytelling comes in. But at that level where, you know, when you're just starting out, facts are, you know, they, they're very important. But over time, what happens? You know, everybody starts having the same facts, especially in this day and age. I mean, you know, um, Five years ago, how many years ago was this really a new thing? Right. right. Now, you know, Samsung and Google and whomever, they all have these things and they vary differently, but they're all doing. So, you know, I mean, you can tell me facts about this, but at this stage, you know, the maturity stage, uh, it's when the facts become, it's kind of a reverse thing where the philosophy the belief that people are buying into and re that, that resonates with people becomes a lot more important. Never, you know, they're all, both are all important. It's just kind of like this over the time of the, over the life cycle, you know, where facts kind of become important here, become less important as brand matures. Right. Um, so, you know, one of the, one of the misconceptions of story branding, and, and I blame myself for this, <laughs> um, because I put so much emphasis on the inner layer is that it's all important all the time. And it is. Mm -hmm. But that is not to say that facts aren't. Right. And um, it's it's important to understand that. Um, it's just a matter of you know not going overboard. 
How do you um, how do you navigate that judgment call when it, to when because because it is a judgment call, right? I mean, it's kind of you got to listen to to the to the ether a little bit and know when when they need it. Like I, I we work with a lot of B two B brands, and in the B two B space especially, people yeah. like to think they're really analytical and they don't make decisions based on emotion they at don't all. Make rational decisions, right? right? Right. Well, typically it's when somebody hands me a, a creative brief with you know fourteen bullet points. Right. I say, you know, why they call them bullet points? <laughs> because they're deadly. <laughs> right. um, but you know, it, 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 to answer your question, um, it's a judgment call. But you know, advertising, especially advertising, has to be single-minded in order to break through. It yeah. does. You cannot. Nobody's sitting there waiting for here all that you can tell them about your particular product. They don't care. Mm-hmm. What they care about is themselves. And they have limited time. We all have ADD these days. You have limited time, limited attention. You know, you've got, if you're going to have a fact, you know, keep it simple and try to, you know, try to combine that with something that's going to emotionally engage people into listening to that fact. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it's just going to fall on deaf ears. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you've got 10 facts that are important, you know, call it down to the more important ones. And then if you're still not able to zero on one, you know, take them one at a time. Yeah. You know, it's like a, you know, these slide for these presentations and you see these slides with, you know, 20 facts on one page. It's mm-hmm. like, it was, you know, it just, you're putting everybody to sleep. Yeah. As opposed to taking one fact, you know, in seven words, stating what it is, maybe putting a graphic behind it to engage people emotionally and then move on to the next one and the next one and keep going like that. Yeah. So. I, I think, I think you, you hit it perfectly and, the, the, and kind of the way I think about it too, where it's the, at least combine it with something that makes us lean forward a little bit and, and engages our emotions. I, I think a lot about, um, th- there's a book that I, I use as an example by uh, the astrophysicist Kip Thorne, where he's, he's, t- he's going to spend like 300 pages is talking about the physics of black holes and it's going to be really sciencey and then you know it's going to be very hard to get into so his yeah. first chapter is just a fictional story about a cosmonaut that like experiences a black hole and like you know it's it's a compelling thing and everything and the whole rest of the book you want to read because you want to understand how that's possible you know it, it like it like gives the the fuel in some way to now oh now i actually want to read this information i want to understand how this works and so we, you know, yeah, it, when we're dealing with B2B brands, it, we find ourselves in that spot all the time where it's like, yeah, we got 20 things we want to hit. It's like, well, what if we could just fill the audience's jetpack with the fuel they need to want to engage all those 20 items, you know, in your proposal or in whatever else you want to do? But it is, but it is, yeah, judgment call. What I tell my B&B clients is, you know, my job is to make your job relatable. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? To get people to be able to identify with what it is that you're doing. You know, you can talk about all these, you know, use all these acronyms and fancy words and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know as well as I do that it's only going to appeal to a limited audience. The bigger audience is not even going to listen to you yeah. until you can talk to them like they're a human being. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they love they acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um I'm I'm curious. Uh, uh, another kind of broad question that I've kind of been asking a lot of folks is, you know, if we're if we're sold on this idea of storytelling being as powerful a tool of persuasion or or a tool of organizing thought or communication as we are, do you think? Do you have any thoughts on kind of what what responsibility we have in wielding it? Or you know, it, it, you know, I, I think about this as like, well, if I really believe this is it, this is this is the magic elixir. You know, is there a wrong way to use this? Is there a wise way to use this? Is there, and I don't know what thoughts you have about that. Well, it's like any tool you put it in the wrong hands. I mean, yeah. Give a boy a hammer, everything's a nail. Right. right. Um, you have to use it the right way. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, I've been in advertising and marketing for 35 some years. I've lost count. But, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I should know a little bit about persuasion. Yeah. Um, and I've learned a lot about persuasion the hard way. <laughs> right. <laughs> Way, what, I, what, I, what I'm coming away with is it's better to be a lighthouse than a tugboat. And what I mean by that is you think about a tugboat. It was out, the, the tugboat and the lighthouse had the same purpose. They're out there to save ships, right? Tugboat goes out every day, comes back, goes back every day, comes back. And its job is to convince that ship that it needs to go this way instead of that way, right? It's just telling that ship there's danger up there. That's the safest route. And the ship, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's pushing out information. 
The lighthouse just standing there. You know? It's not pushing anything. It's just beaming this light and saying, hey, if you're looking at my light, you know, you might want to go that way instead of this way, because that way is going to be a little safer. I'm going to guide you if you let me. But it's your choice. You have the freedom to decide what's right and what's wrong. And that, I think, is the way to best persuade people, is to be that lighthouse, to provide that beacon that they can follow, uh, to, to pull them in as opposed to push out information on them. People do not like to be told what to do or how to think, but they do like to be given things to think about. And as a persuader, the, the objective should be just that. Give people something to think about and give them the freedom of deciding for themselves. And that, by the way, coming full circle, is what stories do. Stories don't tell you how to think, you know. In fact, I don't know if you've ever seen the Andrew Stanton um, uh, TEDx talk. Oh, yeah. Which, actually, where he talks about the two plus two principle. Yep. So, you know, people don't want to be told two plus two equals four. They want to do the math themselves, you know, so let them lead them to the conclusion, but don't make it. And, and, and that I think is the essence of effective ethical mm -hmm. uh, persuasion. It's not manipulative. It's not, I'm not trying to hide anything or, you know, give you this set of facts with you, you know, and, and forcing you to ignore this set of facts. I'm giving you everything. It's, I'm, but I'm serving it in a way to make it digestible, interesting, and in a way that allows you the freedom of dis and, and respect for your intelligence yeah. to decide for yourself what's right. I, I love that. I think that's fantastic. I, I it, it's funny you, you you what you what you made me think about in the middle of that was the idea of how storytelling also if if you if you devote some time to understanding storytelling on this level. I also find that you're better able to discern between when that's ha when the lighthouse is happening or when the tugboat's happening out in the world. You're better able to detect, you know, whether whether this is a piece of marketing that is making you feel like you have a need that you don't really need, or if this is a piece of marketing that's saying, "Hey, you you genuinely have a need, and we have a solution for you." It makes you a wiser consumer, even just to be aware of this. Right, yeah. and consumers are becoming wiser. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I was a kid. I saw ads for kids, and this is well before your time, but, you know, kids' tennis shoes make you run faster and jump harder. <laughs> Mommy, I got to get kids, you know? I mean, I don't know if kids are buying the same kind of logic anymore. Right. But, you know, people have come up, consumers have come a long way. Yeah. And now they have social media and, and um, you know, all kinds of ways to communicate with each other. And in fact, uh, studies continue to show that the, the, you know, advertising is is in the terms of of uh, things that influence purchase decisions. You know, advertising is down here someplace, yeah. and what my friends say and what my peers tell me is way at the top. Yeah. Um, so, not to say that advertising is ineffective, but it gives. In fact, I think one of its main purposes is to give those people at the top language that they can use to describe to their friends what you're all about yeah you know, to, to, to accelerate that word of mouth yeah so on um, it's an interesting place to, to take this because like what how has the world changed because i mean you you wrote story branding i want to say something like 2009 ish somewhere in there well, i wrote it in 2012 and then i revised the story branding two came out in 2015 okay okay so actually really recently but yeah. but the but but in this world where yeah you aren't able to be you know seth godin's king on the hill pushing out the message but instead you have to be that lighthouse as you're saying mm -hmm. and 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 in a world where the most influential stuff is, is, is word of mouth and what my friends and peers are saying on social media. What, what role, I mean, I, I, you, you say advertising is there to give a language, but how, how does, uh, give me a little more on that. Cause, cause I sometimes wonder a little bit of like, you know, it does everything eventually just become uh, a, a user generated content essentially to tell the story of brands, you know, where everyone's saying what they want, you know? Well, when I say language, I'm not just talking about verbal. In fact, I'm talk, probably talking more about nonverbal. Sure. You know, um, those white earbuds that <laughs> you wear, that's a language yeah. you know, that people use to say, hey, I'm that Apple kind of person. Right. You know, um, 
you know, uh, clothes, uh, the, the brand of clothes that you're wearing. It's like, I'm that kind of car you're driving. I'm that kind of person. Yeah. That's the language, you know, that, that you're giving people to, to use to, to tell others um, about who you are and the kind of person that uses that particular brand. Yeah. Uh, so it's that that advertising influences. It, c- it comes down. Branding really influences, I should say. Right. It, 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 it's yeah, you're right. It's, it like it like comes down to like um identity. It's like it's like it's like there's like a bit of you you know the consumer wanting to grab you know you know why do I drink Clarbrun? I don't know. I guess I'm a Clarbrun kind of guy. Like you know what what is the you know? I'm worried about you. What is that? <laughs> yeah, Clarbrun, the 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 uh, sparkling water. Oh yeah. Heard is that something they do in Wisconsin? Oh, that... I, yeah, it's, I, I, well, I'm sure they have it in Chicago. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's that sort of thing, right? I mean, it's there's a, there's a, there's an identity aspect to this. Do you feel that every brand uh, can be part of their consumer's identity in that sense, or part of what like you know how 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 widespread do you do you spread? That's this? a great question. You know, like uh, I don't I've never seen anybody walking around with a baseball cap with a Charmin tissue logo. On right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, there's some brands that lend themselves to being what they call what we call badges, if right. you will, you know, badge that you wear. And other brands obviously don't. But there is an internal um, reinforcement or acknowledgement that goes on when you're ex- when you're buying a non-badge product. You know, when I buy Charmin or whatever toilet paper I'm buying, um, maybe even at a subconscious level, I'm buying something that's consistent with my beliefs and values. It's not just function, you know, it's what it looks like and how, you know, it's, it's how it, how it connects with me emotionally, you know, whether it looks like something that would be, you know, good in my house or, uh, represent me as the shopper or the person in charge of, of, uh, you know, what, what comes into our house. Um, so there is that, you know, that, uh, it's not at the same outward level that you're whatever it is that you're drinking right. be tell people about the kind of person you are. <laughs> um, but it, it, there is something, there's sort of a, um, a self identity or self identification that takes place whenever you're buying something. Um, you know, you wouldn't buy a Signorelli toilet paper, right? Like, you're not familiar with it. sounds kind of weird, <laughs> uh, but you know, something you are familiar with and that you can relate to emotionally, believe it or not is, uh, a more um, popular brand. Yeah. Uh, and as far as that being the language that you use others, well, others see what you're using. And, you know, I mean, your kids see what you, you know, you're buying, you're not buying the off brand mac and cheese, you're buying the craft mac and cheese. That says something, you know, but to your kids. Um, so, yeah, brands are part of our, our stories. You know, even even the non badge brands, I mean, those are very much a part of who we are. They they give us an opportunity to express our identities and tell others what our stories are all about. In your experience, and, and, and I'm curious about this because I'm not I'm I don't consider myself of the marketing world in the same way you are. But so I'm I'm, I'm really curious. Do you find that if 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 more entrepreneurial based companies have an easier time perhaps with this because of the fact that they are able to identify with their business in the same way and all the ways we've discussed. And if we are self-selecting identity particles basically in the world as consumers that, that, that kind of, we, we add on to ourselves. Do you find that in those kind of businesses that the, the entrepreneur at the top in many ways matches the audience in some way or mirrors the audience in some inverse way or how, how what's your experience with that? Yeah, I think, and my experience is yes. Okay. Um, they share an empathy mm-hmm. with the people that they're selling to. Um, now, that's not always the case, um, but off, you know, they don't may they may not buy or, or be within the same um, uh, demographic set as the consumers they're selling to. Um, but there is an empathy, there is an understanding, there is an appreciation for who those people are and what they're all about. And it's something that I think the more successful entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs spend a great deal of time trying to understand. They're the ones out there talking to the consumer. Again, not to find out who they should be, but 
to understand and empathize and identify with their problems, yeah. with their needed solutions. Um, and um, uh, the best entrepreneurs really have a passion, I think, for, for you know, getting that, in, that kind of information. Yeah. So you, you must have not been confused at all to see uh, Mark Zuckerberg out uh, uh, checking out Wisconsin recently. You, you didn't think he was gearing up for politics. You knew what he was doing. <laughs> right. Right. He's just feeling out the audience. He's just listening. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. It, it, it was quite a thing. He came to Madison and went to State Street Brats, and people were all up in arms about it, being like, oh, State Street Brats isn't, isn't the place to come in Madison and all this stuff. But he wanted was, right? Yeah, well, it was a big deal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but everyone thought he was See, that's interesting. See that Madison brand? You know, yeah. it's like don't don't treat that brand that way. <laughs> right. You exactly. If you're coming to Madison, you don't go there. You go Exactly. You know, where you go. But but uh yeah, people get very protective about their brands, yeah. you know. Uh, you especially see that with sports teams. You know? Oh yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess so, that 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 would be the place I'd love to 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 get right before we leave here is is the we talk about sports teams. I mean, at a certain point there, you're getting into areas of belief more like we're like identifying at a point where you can't, you can't change my mind on this thing. This is what I, this is my blood. Right. Um, exactly. Do you, do you find storytelling has a higher batting average with getting people off of prior beliefs, convince, convincing people they've been wrong and now should think this way, or is that still nearly impossible? <laughs> I think your chances are Far better yeah. debating with a story than debating with an alternative fact. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, you know, you tell me a fact, I tell you a fact. You're thinking about the next fact you're going to tell me. Yeah. I'm thinking about the next, and then we go nowhere. Right? Yeah. But yeah. if you tell me a fact and I say, you know, that reminds me of uh, an experience I had. All of a sudden, we're out of the realm of facts and opinions. Yeah. Right. Now you're listening to me. You yeah. may not come to the same conclusion, but your chances of making the point are far greater than they would be arguing with a fact. Yeah, that, yeah, especially if you that 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 totally jives if you think of stories as kind of those simulated experiences, right? That we that that everyone has those life changing experiences where I experience this and now I think of things completely differently. And if stories are those little unit, you know, simulated experiences, it would make perfect sense that what you're saying follows that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because there was an experiment that was conducted at uh, was it Stanford, Stanford, Stanford. I think it was Stanford. But uh, what they found was that they hooked up a, uh, a, a, a a storyteller and his listener to an MRI, and what they found out was that their brains, when the the story was being told, the brain of the listener and the brain of the storyteller lit up in the same exact places. That's right. And so it's sort of like, it's it's like a mind meld, you know, when you're talking to, to somebody. I mean, like right now, it's like, um, I don't want you to think about a red elephant. Right. Do not imagine a red elephant. You can't not imagine a red elephant. Yeah. You know, I've, you know, I've sort of melded with your mind with this visual that I've created. And I've, I've pulled you in to seeing something that I want you to see. Right. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. The research is being done now is incredible. So, and uh, uh, endlessly fascinating. But I, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time um, to chat with me here today. And this is fun. You've been listening to The Nature of Story. I'm Michael Nielsen. You can purchase Jim's book, Story Branding 2.0, Creating Standout Brands Through the Power of Story on Amazon. And you can go to uh, Jim's website at story-lab.net. This podcast was produced by Story First Media, a video content production company focused on storytelling. Our editor is Ryan Smith. Original music composed by Alexander Valdez. Until next time, I'm Michael Nielsen.